Good morning, and welcome back. Guy, it seems like, I'm going to get away from the, around the table, it seems like it's been years, doesn't it? We miss worshiping the Lord together, amen? I am so glad to have y'all back, as many of you as here in worship, um, and I think we're kind of glad that we haven't got a, a bigger crowd because I think all of our allotted pews have folks in them this morning. So this is awesome. Thank you. I'm um, going to start with announcements this morning. By the way, I'm David Kelly, the pastor here, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you. I have to remember that in addition to all of you sitting here, we also are going to have folks watching it on, uh, on video. So um, we're glad that you're all with us for worship. I'm uh, going to start with announcements, and uh, the big announcement, aside from we're back together again, is Vacation Bible School that kicks off tonight, and so I'm going to invite our Bible School Director, uh, Vacation Bible School Director, um, Melinda Bruff, to come forward and share with you some exciting information about it. Good morning. Um, Good morning. It's been an interesting vacation Bible school planning this year. We've all, some of us have stepped out of our comfort zones a lot. Um, I want to thank everybody for all the donations we've got. Um, water, juice boxes, crayons, y'all came through for me. Money. Um, it's, it's been amazing. Um, truly a blessing. Um, everybody's worked hard. We've spent probably more time than we ever have on Vacation Bible School, recording the videos. Um, tonight, at, from 5 to 7, the kids will be coming through our parking lot. Um, we'll have a train station set up out here with our depot and a giant 15-foot train poster. And um, that we'll have that every night for five nights. I invite y'all, I'm going to send out a link through our email. Even if you don't have kids, watch it. You can see what we do. Um, and share the word with all these children out here. So, um, like I said, I invite you to join us. We had 56 kids sign up. That's almost a full vacation Bible school for us. So, um, truly, like I said, we're gotten this out of our church and into our community. So thank you, all of you. You've been a part of that. Thank you, Melinda, and thank you, as I'll repeat that, thank you for all of that you're doing to make sure that this is uh, possible. 56 kids have registered. I think last year we had an average of about 60 a night, if I remember right, so we're almost at capacity from last year in doing something completely new, virtual vacation Bible school. But if you've never seen what a real train station looks like, Am I overselling it? Come on by the church this afternoon and, and, or any time this week between 5 and 7 and you'll see the Shiloh Railroad Station out here in front. So thank you, Melinda. Thanks to Melinda for all of her great leadership. Okay, things are going to be a little bit different during worship this morning. Um, there won't be a children's message. There won't be children's church this morning. We won't, the ushers will not be coming down the aisles and collecting an offering. Um, instead, there are offering, there's an offering box and a basket back in the foyer if you'll leave your gift on your way out. Um, oh, let me just say a quick little commercial about that. If you're one of those folks that you give when you come to church, I'll just remind you, you haven't been here in three months. So just a, just a little plug. Um, when we get to the time of communion, you probably have already noticed it's going to be very different. I'll walk us through it. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll do it together. Um, and I will remind you, um, please, please, please wear your mask whenever you're moving about in the sanctuary. We ask you to wear your mask. But the primary focus of why we have come back and why we're gathered here this morning as it is every Sunday, is to praise the Lord. Amen? That's what we're going to be doing. We're not asking you to stand and sing during the worship service. We can't stop you from singing if you want to sing where you're sitting, but um, we're here to praise God. And one of the great ways that we do that is through song. This is J July 5th. We just celebrated Independence Day. 
And so we're going to start this morning with a patriotic hymn. We're going to begin this morning with the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Graciously, Lord, upon this nation, where it is in pride, subdue it, where it is in need, supply it, where it is in error, correct it, where it is hurting, heal it, where it is lost, guide it, where it is divided, unite it. And where it holds to that which is compassionate and just and loving, strengthen and support it. We ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, friends, I don't know about you, but it's good to be back in the Father's house. Let's sing about it. Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a chemist for your strength My story isn't over, my story's just begun Hell, you won't defy me cause that's what my father does Yes, fail you won't defy me cause that's what my father does Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Rival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, and the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. No failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your 
see a big problem with this right now it's impossible for me to take roll I got folks that sit in the back that are sitting in the front folks that sit in the back that are sitting in the back now, some of you I can figure out but I'll have to I'll, I'll get a report from Gerald on Monday say okay now who was really here and who wasn't now, our scripture passage for today uh, comes from the book of Romans, from Paul's letter to the Romans. And in it, I think this is maybe one of the most personal passages in all of scripture. Um, Paul is being brutally honest, I think is the way we would put it in this scripture today. Listen for God's special word for you, especially if you have ever struggled with a decision, or if you've ever struggled with, uh, with the way things are going in your life. Listen to God's word today. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing I hate. But if I'm doing the thing that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is right. But now I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me, that is, in my body. The desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives in me that is doing it. So I find that as a rule, I, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. I gladly agree with the law on the inside, but I see a different law at work in my body. It wages a war against the law of my mind and takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this corpse? Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I'm a slave to God's law in my mind, but I'm a slave to sin's law in my body. These are the words of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Of course, it didn't happen this year because of the pandemic and all, but uh, one year, little Johnny brought home his season-ending report card. And he just laid it on the table. So his mom took a, her time, went over and looked through it, and noticed that he had gotten a terrible grade in conduct. And so she asked little Johnny, she said, what is the deal here? He said, mom, it's not my fault. Conduct is my hardest course. We can relate to that because oftentimes we find it extremely difficult to do the right thing. And that's what Paul's talking about this morning in Romans chapter 7. He's wrestling within his own soul over doing that which is good and that which is wrong. And all of us can identify. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing I hate. Anybody ever been there? 
The desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do. Well, how do we tell when something is right or wrong? How do we tell when something is ethical or unethical? Let's face it, it's not always easy to tell the difference between right and wrong. There are some common guidelines that we can use for making moral decisions, but they're not completely reliable. Here's just three that we use every day to make moral decisions. The first thing we often do is is people say, just use plain common sense when you have to make a decision. You know, if you're tempted to fight or to be sexually promiscuous, or if you're tempted to cheat or lie or steal or gossip or hate, if you're tempted to indulge in substance abuse, just let common sense rise up and tell yourself, this is not right. But is it really that easy? A priest was sitting on a bus and an intoxicated man sat down next to him. I mean, he was a mess. His clothes were all disheveled. He had red lipstick all over his face. He had a half full bottle of whiskey hanging out of a torn coat pocket. The man sat down and pulled out a newspaper and began to read. And after a few minutes, he asked the priest, Father, what causes arthritis? And the priest saw an opening, so he said, Sir, let me tell you, it comes from wild living, being with cheap women, drinking too much, and not having common sense for your common man. Well, I'll be, the drunk said, and he just kept on reading. Well, a few miles down the road, the priest felt kind of bad about it, so he nudged the man, he said, Sir, I I apologize. I didn't mean to come on quite so strong as that. He said, by the way, how long have you had arthritis? And he said, oh, no, not me. I was reading in the paper that the Pope has it. Common sense can help us to make moral decisions and ethical choices. But the problem with common sense, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but it just doesn't seem to be all that common anymore. And it's, it's a man-made creation, and so therefore it's flawed just like we're all flawed. So sometimes we go to a second choice. Regardless of whatever the moral decision is you're making, just, just come out in the open with it. What if the thing that you're thinking about doing were made public? What, what if everybody knew? Would you still do it? If you put that moral decision you're making out for for your behavior to be seen by everyone, to be tested by being out in the open, if you strip it of its secrecy, what then? You know, Jesus often spoke about light and darkness. So imagine that whatever you're about to engage in was going to be in tomorrow's dispatch or, or posted on Facebook. Would you want your parents to know or your children? What about your friends? Imagine that it's being talked about openly and even included in the funeral message for you at the end of your life. If what you're thinking about or doing, thinking about doing, can't stand that kind of publicity, then it's probably not good. If it is, it it might be all right. The problem now, of course, is that that even things that aren't healthy can be put out into the public eye. It's popular today, maybe even fashionable, to parade perversions nowadays. So that's not quite a good discernment. And then finally, there are those who say, "Just, just try to be your best self when you're making a moral choice. You know, sometimes we need to step out beyond our, our, on our own, beyond our circle of uh, friends and all, and, and move past the crowd and, and those things that everyone else is doing. We need to s- discern what God is calling us to do, who God is calling us to be, and then to do our best to be that just and moral self. And that's what Paul's doing today in our scripture 
And, and it is a good test for morality. Can I do whatever I'm thinking about and still be my best self? When I was growing up, we had a weekly prayer in the Episcopal worship service that, that I was always a little stumped by. It was in the prayer of confession. Lord, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. Now, I have to tell you, as a child, I was always scratching my head wondering, what is that about? But now that I've gotten older, I, I now have, can understand this mentality of herd-mindedness. You know, that, that we just live with our heads down and automatically follow the herd, and, and we never look up to see where we're going or to follow our own direction. If everyone else is doing it, then it must be okay, right? If you're morally confused, if you're facing an ethical dilemma, if you're thinking about making a moral decision, if you're trying to distinguish between right and wrong, you need to ask yourself this question. Can I do that thing and still have a clear conscience? Of course, the problem with being our trying to be our best self is that oftentimes our best isn't good enough, and a clear conscience doesn't necessarily equal a moral conscience. Now, the test of common sense, bringing something out into the open and, and having a clear conscience, they're all flawed. The moral compass of our humanity can easily go awry. But thankfully, there are two God-given standards that are reliable and that are accurate in making moral choices. They've stood the test of time and they will not lead you astray. Paul knew it. He, towards the end of our passage this morning, says, I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this dead corpse? Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you feel confused or perplexed or bewildered, if you're uncertain about what's right and what's wrong, then you need to come back to the world's one unique person, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is our pattern and our blueprint for living. He's the measuring stick by whom we see what's good and wholesome and holy. He is our living Lord and our Savior. So here's the key question to ask. Can I do this thing and still be Christ-like? Can I say this and still be like Jesus? Can I participate in this activity and still be Christ-like? If not, friends, it's obviously wrong. Now, in our culture, and even in the church, it's become increasingly difficult to deny anything. It's more fashionable to just affirm everything. To be sure, we, we need to avoid negativism and legalism, but truth and morality, I'll tell you today, have boundaries. Dr. Alan Bloom was a professor at Yale. He wrote a book entitled The Closing of the American Mind. And in it he wrote, I quote him, almost every student entering the university believes, or says he believes, that truth is relative. Friends, if truth has no boundaries, then the acceptance of anything and everything becomes the norm. And in our world today, it seems that the greatest offense that we can commit is to differ with the views of another person, no matter how bizarre or outlandish those views are. And the relativism has infected our church, as we know. Charles Colson has written that, and I quote him, 53% of those claiming to be Bible-believing, conservative Christians say that there's no such thing as absolute truth. Well, no wonder. No wonder even us in the church have trouble defer defining what's right and what's wrong. Without question, God's Word has set clear boundaries. The Ten Commandments 
set moral and ethical boundaries. They tell us about the boundaries between God and us and between us and our neighbors. Do not steal sets boundaries around our neighbor's property. And there are other commandments that set boundaries around our neighbor's life and his spouse and his reputation. When we abandon those boundaries, life begins to spin out of control. And, but when we affirm God's truth, and when we take a stand for biblical morals, oh friends, that puts us standing against the grain of our culture. Many years ago, Dr. Dean Smith, and no, not the Dean Smith of North Carolina fame, Dr. Dean Smith, the professor at Centenary College in New Jersey, gave a famous lecture. He was a distinguished looking man. He always wore black suits with a black eye patch. He was a brilliant scholar, a great communicator, and he befriended many of his students. He was one of those people that was a legend in his own time, if you will. Well, he gave a famous lecture on moral truth and distinguishing between immorality and morality. And in that speech, much uh, like this, before a group of students, he said, friends, how wide is my desk? Well, after a few moments, the students began to make guesses. Oh, 72 inches wide, I believe. Another said, no, maybe 68 inches. And somebody else said, oh, it might be 75 inches. And Dr. Smith said, those are all good guesses, but one of them, of course, is more nearly accurate than the others. So, so how do we determine the one that's most accurate? How do we decide what the correct answer is? And just like this, there was silence in the room. And finally, one of the students rather tentatively said, we could use a measuring stick. And the professor said, of course, you have to use a measuring stick to determine the actual size. You have to measure it. And then Dr. Smith moved to the whiteboard and he took a, one of those uh, erasable pins and in silence, he began to draw the outline of a cross and he just continued to do it over and over the outline of a cross and after a little bit he stepped back from the board and he stood and he pointed there's your measuring stick there's how you tell what's moral and what's immoral. Friends, when the world says, it's okay to steal from your office every once in a while, remember what the Bible says about stealing. When the world tells you, it's not so bad to tell a lie, I mean, does your wife really want to know how her hair looks? Remember what the Bible says about telling the truth. When the world says, it's okay to cheat, or to hurt others, or to gossip, or to hate, or to hold a grudge, remember what the Bible says about those things. When the world says, it's okay to commit sexual immorality, adultery, or premarital sex, or pornography, remember what the Bible says about sexual immorality. We have a moral compass. It's a light for our path. It's, it's all the authority we need for truth and morality. Now, truth is, we have, as baptized Christians, we have God's unconditional love. But we don't have God's unconditional approval of any and every action. When you're making moral decisions, when you're trying to decide what's right, what's wrong, Remember the word of God and remember the example that we have in Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, God's people said, Amen.
Friends, we're going to move to the time when we truly uh, recall the sacrifice, the love, and the, um, the meaning of true life found in Jesus Christ. I invite you to come to the table of love. At this table, we will find strength for our journeys and rest for our souls. Before we go to Lord's table, we're going to share together in a prayer of confession. Let us pray together using this prayer. Oops. I'll have a prayer for us. Gracious God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your guidance through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Lord, despite that indwelling, oftentimes we turn astray. We, um, we don't always follow the Spirit's leading. Like Paul, we don't do the thing that we want to do, and instead we do the thing that we hate. Lord, renew us now, especially in this time at your table. Recreate our spirits that we may perfectly and completely love and serve you. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now we'll come to the table. Go ahead. Becky, go ahead. And we're going to begin this prayer responsibly this morning. Through the steadfast love of God, we come to this table. Our hearts rejoice in the saving love of our Creator. May the Holy Spirit be with you. Share your hearts freely. In this time and space, we delight in our Creator. A table was shaped so beautifully with round edges and smooth corners. A table wide enough for the diversity of the body of Christ. A table able to stretch from pole to pole. As we savor this sacrament, remembering the one who gave us this meal, we recall that Christ abides with us here and now. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this, <clears throat> do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Holy God, send your spirit to encircle this table with your love. Bless all who are present here and now and all who are present in our hearts. Amen. And now as Jesus has taught us to pray, we too pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Would my communion assistants please come forward? Friends, obviously communion is going to be quite different this morning. Um, the ushers or the communion assistants will bring a, a tray by. And if you'll just take a packet of the, the juice and the wafer are all together. If you take a packet for each person sitting in your, your pew and then just hold on to them until everyone has been served. And then we will um, we'll share in communion together. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I guess that's all right. Okay, everybody's been served. Now, if you would uh, peel back just the cellophane, just the, uh, the printed cellophane, if you'll peel that back and take the wafer that you'll find. And I'm gonna ask you to hold that kind of up in front of you so I can tell that everybody's there. Friends, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. You may consume the, the wafer. And then if you would uh, peel the foil back carefully. <laughs> If you would, when you're ready, hold the cup up for me. Friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. You may drink.
and now the communion assistants will come back through with the uh, trays to collect your empty cups. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your love, for the gift of this table, for the gift of this simple meal. May it empower us and strengthen us to live as your people faithfully in the world. And now as we prepare to go out into that world, may we go forth as people renewed by your love, O God, and may we go forth to renew others with that same love. Amen. Friends, the praise team's going to close us with a blessing.
their children, may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children, may his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you, he is with you, he is with you, in the morning, in the evening, and you're coming, and you're going, for a, a wedding or a funeral, if you would please wait for, uh, for the usher to dismiss you. Thank you.